Hi, Ruben here and welcome to Anatomy Movement, where anatomy becomes fun anatomy. We have summarized and detailed notes, acronyms, HD images to build your photographic memory, X-rays images, tabled notes and questions and answers at the end of each video to help you remember all that we have learned. Without further ado, let's dive into today's topic. Joints of the upper limb. The joints of the upper limb include, acromioclavicular joint, sternoclavicular joint, shoulder joint, elbow joint, radio ulnar joint, wrist joint, metacarpophalangeal joint and proximal interphalangeal joint. The acromioclavicular joint is an articulation in the shoulder region between the clavicle and the acromion of the scapula. It is a plain type synovial joint. The acromioclavicular joint consists of an articulation between the lateral end of the clavicle and the acromion of the scapula. The joint capsule of the acromioclavicular joint encloses the two articular surfaces. It consists of a loose layer of fibrous tissue, which is lined internally by a synovial membrane. The posterior aspect of the joint capsule is reinforced by fibers from the trapezius muscle. There are three main ligaments that strengthen and stabilize the acromioclavicular joint. Acromioclavicular ligament runs horizontally from the acromion to the lateral clavicle. It covers the joint capsule, reinforcing its superior aspect. Conoid ligament runs vertically from the coracoid process of the scapula to the conoid tubercle of the clavicle. Trapezoid ligament runs from the coracoid process of the scapula to the trapezoid line of the clavicle. The conoid and trapezoid ligaments are collectively known as the coracoclavicular ligament. The acromioclavicular joint allows a gliding movement in the superior, inferior and anteroposterior planes, along with a small amount of axial rotation. As no muscle acts directly on the joint, all movements are passive, and are initiated by movement at other joints. The arterial supply to the acromioclavicular joint is via the suprascapular artery, arises from the subclavian artery at the thyrocervical trunk. Thoracoacromial artery, arises from the axillary artery. The venous drainage accompanies the major arteries. The acromioclavicular joint is innervated by articular branches of the suprascapular and lateral pectoral nerves. They both arise directly from the brachial plexus. Quiz. Which type of synovial joint is the acromioclavicular joint? Plain joint. Hinge joint. Saddle joint. Ellipsoid joint. The correct answer is, plain joint. The sternoclavicular joint is an articulation between the clavicle and the manubrium of the sternum. It is a saddle-type synovial joint which acts to link the upper limb with the trunk. Anatomical structure. Articulating surfaces. The sternoclavicular joint is formed by an articulation between three structures. Sternal end of the clavicle. Manubrium of the sternum. First coastal cartilage. Cartilage associated with the first rib. The articular surfaces are covered with fibrocartilage as opposed to hyaline cartilage, present in the majority of synovial joints. The joint is separated into two compartments by a fibrocartilaginous articular disc. The joint capsule of the sternoclavicular joint extends to the borders of the articular surfaces. It is lined internally by a synovial membrane, which produces synovial fluid to reduce friction between the articulating structures. The ligaments of the sternoclavicular joint provide much of its stability. There are four main ligaments. Sternoclavicular ligaments, anterior and posterior, reinforces the joint capsule anteriorly and posteriorly. Interclavicular ligament, attaches to the sternal end of both clavicles and reinforces the joint capsule superiorly. Costoclavicular ligament, attaches the first rib and costal cartilage to the inferior surface of the clavicle. It is the main stabilizing force for the joint, resisting elevation of the pectoral girdle. The sternoclavicular joint has a large degree of mobility, with several movements possible. Elevation of the shoulders, shrugging the shoulders or abducting the arm over 90, Depression of the shoulders, drooping shoulders or extending the arm at the shoulder behind the body. Protraction of the shoulders, moving the shoulder girdle anteriorly. Retraction of the shoulders, moving the shoulder girdle posteriorly. Rotation, when the arm is raised over the head, the clavicle rotates passively as the scapula rotates. The sternoclavicular joint is required to be both mobile to accommodate the movements of the upper limb and strong to form a stable connection between the upper limb and the trunk. 
Here we will consider the factors which contribute to both its mobility and its stability. Mobility. Type of joint, being a saddle joint it can move in two axes. Articular disc. This allows the clavicle and the manubrium to slide over each other more freely, allowing for rotation and movement in a third axis. Stability. Joint capsule, thick and strong. Ligaments, particularly the costoclavicular ligament, which transfers forces from the clavicle to the manubrium via the costal cartilage. Blood supply. The arterial supply to the sternoclavicular joint is from the internal thoracic artery and the suprascapular artery. Innervation. The sternoclavicular joint is supplied by the medial supraclavicular nerve and the nerve to subclavius. Quiz. Among the listed structures, which one does not contribute to the articulating surface of the sternoclavicular joint? Manubrium. Medial end of clavicle. First coastal ridge. Xiphoid process. The correct answer is, xiphoid process. The shoulder joint, glenohumeral joint, is an articulation between the scapula and the humerus. It is a ball and socket type synovial joint, and one of the most mobile joints in the human body. Anatomical structure. Articulating surfaces. The shoulder joint is formed by an articulation between the head of the humerus and the glenoid cavity or fossa of the scapula. This gives rise to the alternate name for the shoulder joint, the glenohumeral joint. Like most synovial joints, the articulating surfaces are covered with hyaline cartilage. The head of the humerus is much larger than the glenoid fossa, giving the joint a wide range of movement at the cost of instability. To reduce the disproportion in surfaces, the glenoid fossa is deepened by a fibrocartilage rim, called the glenoid labrum. Joint capsule. The joint capsule is a fibrous sheath which encloses the structures of the joint. It extends from the anatomical neck of the humerus to the border or rim of the glenoid fossa. The joint capsule is lax, permitting greater mobility, particularly abduction. The synovial membrane lines the inner surface of the joint capsule and produces synovial fluid to reduce friction between the articular surfaces. Ligaments. Ligaments play an important role in stabilizing the shoulder joint. Glenohumeral ligaments. Superior, middle and inferior, extend from the humerus to the glenoid fossa, reinforcing the joint capsule. They act to stabilize the anterior aspect of the joint. Coracohumeral ligament extends from the base of the coracoid process to the greater tubercle of the humerus. It supports the superior part of the joint capsule. Transverse humeral ligament extends between the two tubercles of the humerus. It holds the tendon of the long head of the biceps in the intertubercular groove. Coracoacromial ligament extends between the acromion and coracoid process of the scapula, forming an arch-like structure over the shoulder joint coracoacromial arch. This resists superior displacement of the humeral head. Bursae. A bursa is a synovial fluid-filled sac, which acts as a cushion between tendons and other joint structures. There are several bursae present in the shoulder joint. Subacromial, located deep to the deltoid and acromion, and superficial to the supraspinatus tendon and joint capsule. It reduces friction beneath the deltoid, promoting free motion of the rotator cuff tendons. Subscapular, located between the subscapularis tendon and the scapula. It reduces friction on the tendon during movement at the shoulder joint. Movements. The shoulder joint is an extremely mobile joint, with a wide range of movement possible. Extension, upper limb backwards in sagittal plane, posterior deltoid, latissimus dorsi and teres major. Flexion, upper limb forwards in sagittal plane, pectoralis major, anterior deltoid and coracobrachialis. Biceps brachii weakly assists in forward flexion. Abduction upper limb away from midline in coronal plane. The first 0 to 15 degrees of abduction is produced by the supraspinatus. The middle fibers of the deltoid are responsible for the next 15 to 90 degrees. Past 90 degrees, the scapula needs to be rotated to achieve abduction, that is carried out by the trapezius and serratus anterior. Adduction upper limb towards midline in coronal plane, pectoralis major, latissimus dorsi and teres major. Internal rotation, rotation towards the midline, so that the thumb is pointing medially, subscapularis, pectoralis major, latissimus dorsi, teres major and anterior deltoid. External rotation, rotation away from the midline, so that the thumb is pointing laterally, infraspinatus and teres minor. Circumduction, moving the upper limb in a circle, produced by a combination of the movements described. Above, mobility and stability. 
The shoulder joint is one of the most mobile in the body, at the expense of stability. Here, we shall consider the factors the permit movement, and those that contribute towards joint structure. Mobility. Type of joint, ball and socket joint. Bony surfaces, shallow glenoid cavity and large humeral head, there is a 1, 4 disproportion in surfaces. A commonly used analogy is the golf ball and tee. Joint capsule, lax, stability. Rotator cuff muscles, surround the shoulder joint, attaching to the tuberosities of the humerus, whilst also fusing with the joint capsule. The resting tone of these muscles act to compress the humeral head into the glenoid cavity. Glenoid labrum, a fibrocartilaginous ridge surrounding the glenoid cavity. It deepens the cavity and creates a seal with the head of humerus, reducing the risk of dislocation. Ligaments, act to reinforce the joint capsule and form the coracoacromial arch. Biceps tendon, it acts as a minor humeral head depressor, thereby contributing to stability. Blood supply, the shoulder joint is supplied by the anterior and posterior circumflex humeral arteries, which are both branches of the axillary artery. There are also contributions from the suprascapular artery itself a branch of the thyrocervical trunk. Innervation, sensory innervation to the shoulder joint is from the axillary and suprascapular nerves, the elbow joint. The elbow is the joint connecting the upper arm to the forearm. It is classed as a hinge-type synovial joint. Articulating surfaces. The elbow joint consists of two separate articulations. Trochlear notch of the ulna and the trochlea of the humerus. Head of the radius and the capitulum of the humerus. Like all synovial joints, the elbow joint has a capsule enclosing the joint. This in itself is strong and fibrous, strengthening the joint. The joint capsule is thickened medially and laterally to form collateral ligaments, which stabilize the flexing and extending motion of the arm. There are many bursae in the elbow, but only a few have clinical importance. Intratendinous olcranon, located within the tendon of the triceps brachii. Subtendinous olcranon, between the olcranon and the tendon of the triceps brachii, reducing friction between the two structures during extension and flexion of the arm. Subcutaneous olcranon bursa, between the olcranon and the overlying connective tissue, implicated in olcranon bursitis. Ligaments. The joint capsule of the elbow is strengthened by ligaments medially and laterally. The radial collateral ligament is found on the lateral side of the joint, extending from the lateral epicondyle, and blending with the annular ligament of the radius a ligament from the proximal radioulnar joint. The ulnar collateral ligament originates from the medial epicondyle, and attaches to the coronoid process and olcranon of the ulna. Blood supply. The elbow joint receives a rich arterial supply from a surrounding network of vessels, which is formed by branches of the brachial artery. Innervation. The elbow joint is innervated by branches of the medial, musculocutaneous, radial and ulnar nerves. Movements. The orientation of the bones forming the elbow joint produces a hinge-type synovial joint, which allows for extension and flexion of the forearm. Extension, triceps brachii and anconius. Flexion, brachialis, biceps brachii, brachioradialis. Quiz, which of the following is not an articulating surface of the elbow joint? Trochlea, radial head, capitulum, radial tuberosity. The correct answer is, radial tuberosity radio ulnar joint. The radio ulnar joints are two locations in which the radius and ulna articulate in the forearm. Proximal radio ulnar joint, located near the elbow. It is articulation, between the head of the radius and the radial notch of the ulna. Distal radio ulnar joint, located near the wrist. It is an articulation between the ulnar notch of the radius and the ulnar head. Both of these joints are classified as pivot joints, responsible for pronation and supination of the forearm. The proximal radio ulnar joint is located immediately distal to the elbow joint, and is enclosed within the same articular capsule. It is formed by an articulation between the head of the radius and the radial notch of the ulna. The radial head is held in place by the annular radial ligament, which forms a collar around the joint. The annular radial ligament is lined with a synovial membrane, reducing friction during movement. Movement is produced by the head of the radius rotating within the annular ligament. There are two movements possible at this joint, pronation and supination. Pronation, produced by the pronator quadratus and pronator teres. Supination, produced by the supinator and biceps brachii. This distal radio ulnar joint is located just proximally to the wrist joint. 
It is an articulation between the ulnar notch of the radius and the ulnar head. In addition to anterior and posterior ligaments strengthening the joint, there is also a fibrocartilaginous ligament present, called the articular disc. It serves two functions. Binds the radius and ulna together, and holds them together during movement at the joint. Separates the distal radioulnar joint from the wrist joint. Like the proximal radioulnar joint, this is a pivot joint, allowing for pronation and supination. The ulnar notch of the radius slides anteriorly over the head of the ulnar during such movements. Pronation, produced by the pronator quadratus and pronator teres. Supination, produced by the supinator and biceps brachii. Interosseous membrane. The interosseous membrane is a sheet of connective tissue that joins the radius and ulna together between the radioulnar joints. It spans the distance between the medial radial border and the lateral ulnar border. There are small holes in the sheet, as a conduit for the forearm vasculature. This connective tissue sheet has three major functions. Holds the radius and ulna together during pronation and supination of the forearm, providing addition stability. Acts as a site of attachment for muscles in the anterior and posterior compartments of the forearm. Transfers forces from the radius to the ulna. Quiz. Which of the following movements occur at the radioulnar joints? Pronation. Flexion. Extension. Abduction. The correct answer is, pronation. The wrist joint. The wrist joint, also known as the radiocarpal joint, is an articulation between the radius and the carpal bones of the hand. It is condyloid-type synovial joint which marks the area of transition between the forearm and the hand. In this video, we shall look at the anatomy of the wrist joint, its structure, neurovasculature and clinical correlations. Anatomical structure. Articulating surfaces. The wrist joint is formed by an articulation between distal end of the radius and the articular disc. Proximal row of the carpal bones except the pisiform. Together, the carpal bones form a convex surface, which fits into the concave shape of the radius and articular disc. The ulna is prevented from articulating with the carpal bones by the presence of a fibrocartilaginous ligament, the articular disc. Instead, the ulna articulates with the radius just proximal to the wrist, at the distal radioulnar joint. Joint capsule. The joint capsule of the wrist joint attaches to the radius, ulna and the proximal row of the carpal bones. It is lined internally by a synovial membrane, which produces synovial fluid to reduce friction between the articulating structures. Ligaments. There are four main ligaments located at the wrist joint. Palmar radiocarpal, located on the palmar anterior side of the joint. It passes from the radius to both rows of carpal bones. Its function, apart from increasing stability, is to ensure that the hand follows the forearm during supination. Dorsal radiocarpal, found on the dorsum posterior side of the hand. It passes from the radius to both rows of carpal bones. It contributes to the stability of the wrist, but also ensures that the hand follows the forearm during pronation. Ulnar collateral, runs from the ulnar styloid process to the triquetrum and pisiform. It acts to prevent excessive radial lateral deviation of the hand. Radial collateral, runs from the radial styloid process to the scaphoid and trapezium. It acts to prevent excessive ulnar medial deviation of the hand. Movements. The wrist is an ellipsoidal condyloid type synovial joint, allowing for movement along two axes. This means that flexion, extension, adduction and abduction can all occur at the wrist joint. All the movements of the wrist are performed by the muscles of the forearm. Flexion, produced mainly by the flexor carpi ulnaris, flexor carpi radialis, with assistance from the flexor digitorum superficialis. Extension, produced mainly by the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis, and extensor carpi ulnaris, with assistance from the extensor digitorum. Adduction, produced by the extensor carpi ulnaris and flexor carpi ulnaris. Abduction, produced by the abductor pollicis longus, flexor carpi radialis, extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis. Mobility and stability. The wrist joint is a highly mobile joint to allow the hand to move in several directions. Because of this, the wrist joint is prone to injury. The wrist joint does maintain some stability due to intrinsic and extrinsic ligaments. Intrinsic carpal ligaments, the tiny ligaments between the carpal bones, are short ligaments that provide stability but are easily damaged with excessive force or twisting due to their small size. 
The extrinsic ligaments, which include the palmar dorsal radiocarpal ligaments and the radial and ulnar collateral ligaments are stronger and stabilize from the radius and ulna to the carpal bones of the wrist. They are discussed above in further detail. Blood supply. The wrist joint receives blood from branches of the dorsal and palmar carpal arches, which are derived from the ulnar and radial arteries. For more information, see blood supply to the upper limb. Innervation. Innervation to the wrist is delivered by branches of three nerves median nerve anterior interosseous branch radial nerve posterior interosseous branch ulnar nerve deep and dorsal branches quiz among the listed carpal bones which one does not contribute to the articulatory surface of the wrist joint chipoid lunate triquetrum trapezium the correct answer is trapezoid thanks for watching like and subscribe to anatomy movement channel for more